sign up for our news review segments where we take a look at one of our stories in a little bit more detail. Despite escalation of the Ukraine war in many fronts, the West seems hell-bent on supplying Kiev with more weapons. Now the UK says it does not rule out sending fighter jets to Ukraine. On the process of jets, I mean, pretty clear that, you know, one thing I've learned over the last year is don't rule anything in or rule anything out, right? I mean, that is the simple reality, is uh, we respond uh, to the needs of the Ukrainians at the time based on what the Ukrainians tell us, what we see in things like intelligence and our knowledge of the Russians on the battlefield. And right now, what the Ukrainians need is ability. Wallace, however, said fighter jets would not be a magic wand in the war. He added that London is open to sending other military systems to Ukraine to help it in the war with Russia. His comments came after Downing Street apparently ruled out sending combat planes to Ukraine as not pragmatic. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak's office said that such aircraft are highly sophisticated and take months to learn how to train and fly. The United States, for its part, has also ruled out any deliveries of F-16s to Ukraine for now. Kiev has been urging its Western allies to supply it with long-range missiles and fighter jets to counter Russia. Western countries have so far supplied Kiev with arms and munitions worth tens of billions of dollars. Since the start of the war last year, Russia has warned that such arms supplies only serve to prolong the war. Joining us is Jan Oberg, a founder at the Transitional Dot Live from Lund, Sweden. And we also have Glenn Dyson, a professor of political science at the University of Southeastern Norway from Oslo. Welcome. Uh, Jan, if I can start with you. Well, there is acknowledgement that delivering warplanes or tanks or other sophisticated military equipment to Ukraine will take months for the Ukrainian armed forces to be able to be to manage and train and and use them do you see, do you not see this as a provocation by the west against russia to and essentially to prolong this war well let me say perhaps because i'm a peace and conflict researcher i don't bother too much about the military aspects i don't bother too much about personalities involved in this. I don't bother too much about the things that media bother about. What I bother about is to make the distinction, and I think that will be helpful for your viewers, the distinction between the war and the violence on the one hand and the underlying conflict. This is not only a Russia-Ukraine war. This is a NATO-Russia war that plays out, conflict that plays out in war in Ukraine. So. What you see now is everybody's obsessed with weapons. I mean, Leopard tanks are now treated as fashion shows in the media. Total waste of time. The only thing we should do is to look at what is underlying this war. What is the thing that Russia and NATO cannot agree on? What is it that stands between the parties? And let's address that. What we see now is mission creep. It's going to go to hell. There will soon be a counteroffensive, or whatever you'd call it, by Russia. You will see more destruction of Ukraine. And it is on the responsibility of NATO to keep on doing this wrong thing. And I don't know who can stop it, but it must stop. I have argued six, seven years ago that the only organization in the world that has the capacity, if we want it to have, and the experience and the knowledge and the brilliant people is the United Nations. And a huge United Nations or, or mission there for peacekeeping, for monitoring a ceasefire and for getting people to, uh, uh, for, to get people to the negotiation table is the only way ahead. This must stop. Okay. So, uh, Glenn, you've got the UK Defence uh, Minister there saying that there won't be this... Uh, the, the delivery of a, any fighter jets won't be a magic wand. So essentially, it's not going to end the, the conflict. Uh, if it's not going to be a magic wand, then why bother? Well, uh, 
Uh, it, it's a way to prolong the conflict. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, there's a little bit of panic now uh, across a lot of Western capitals because uh, NATO we, we're not winning this war. We we, we appear to be losing, and uh, uh, again the, the losses uh, they keep becoming expen uh, growing a bit out of control in Ukraine in terms of loss of men and equipment. So so at the moment uh, in NATO we're not, we're in a trouble. We either has to, we either have to sit down and negotiate with Russia, find a peace, or we have to escalate. And uh, uh, in order to, you know, as they say, turn the tide in this war to, you know, introduce a game changer. Now, I, I think there's there's very little we can do at this time. There's um, uh, there's not <laughs> there's not enough weapons. Uh, also, the Ukrainian army has been uh, ravaged. What's happened there is yeah, well, it's horrible. Uh, as my well, Swedish colleague pointed out, it's been uh, yes, so, so many deaths, so much destruction. So at the moment, there's very little that can be, do, be done to turn this around. So it does beg the question, uh, what is the purpose of this? I think it's some of it's to, to prolong the war. Again, uh, many well, in the United States, as well as their European counterparts, have, have argued that uh, an objective should be to weaken Russia as much as possible. So as long as we're not fighting with our own troops, we're fighting with Ukrainians. Uh, uh, I think there's a willingness to expend more lives in order to weaken Russia. Uh, some probably, it's also possible that some of this could simply be, uh, uh, yeah, well, political posturing. So perhaps sending more weapons to get some or something to more to negotiate with in any negotiations with Russia. It could also be some domestic politics. I mean, after. NATO loses this war, uh, perhaps, you know, a lot of politicians can attempt to say, well, we try to do everything, we send tanks, artillery system, but um, at the end of the day, I think also a strong motivation is simply that, uh, well, for Washington, they're in a very good position at the moment, even though they're losing the war, but they set up a nice uh, firing position where they can kill Russians and weaken the Russian Federation without the Russians being able to fire back at the Americans. So, right. uh, I think, again, in a proxy war, the um, you know, they, they try to milk it for what it's worth. Right. And then, Jan, you know, uh, the fighting generally has been focused in eastern Ukraine. This is the same region of eastern Ukraine that has been that has witnessed fighting since 2014 between ethnic Russians and the Ukrainian forces and ended up killing about 14,000 people. So getting back to your point of view about regarding peace, why not... Uh, uh, give Russia the security guarantees that it wanted? Why not go back to the Minsk agreements? Why not explore other avenues to try and get a peaceful resolution to this conflict, do you think? I agree with you. These are the things we should discuss much more, but the media are obsessed with military affairs. And secondly, we should discuss how can Ukraine become a safe country, a secure country without being a member of NATO. But I think, um, adding to this, it's not in the interest of the Western world at all to prolong the war. The economy is in a terrible shape, and the problem is that the response, whatever you think about the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the response of the West was absolutely panicking, without consequence evaluation, and without any kind of decency. It was just a full barrage of cancelling everything, do all the harm you can to, can to Russia, and that is now boomeranging. You will see the Rand Corporation of all, who produced a report in 2019 about how to unbalance Russia. You will see that they just last week published a report on how to avoid a long war. You see the Croatian president, you see Hungary, you see people beginning to say this will have economic terrible consequences it already has for the western world we've got to stop this i think the western unity is crumbling and when mr stoltenberg the secretary general of nato has to go to south korea and japan to solicit some kind of support you know that seems to me to be in desperation so i think it might stop the question is how can we have some secret diplomacy behind the scenes, outside the limelight of the media, where Russia, NATO, US and Ukraine somehow begin to talk about how, without losing anybody's face, 
how can we stop the fighting and get to uh, some kind of consultations, mediation, and then finally, finally, negotiations. You shouldn't start with negotiations. That's people who don't know anything about it. We, you should do a lot of things before you seek to uh, go to a table, because if it doesn't work out in an, a peace agreement on a, at a table, you will have failed. So that's what the media should discuss, but they don't. And politicians go there and celebrate, you know, the new weapons. They, the Danish government has just been there, you know, and all this. It is a waste of our time and it's a waste of lives. And Ukraine will be destroyed if we continue this. Right, indeed. And then, Glenn, as Kiev requests more and more sophisticated weapons, it started with ammunition and bullets and armored vehicles, as it has gone to tanks and warplanes. And NATO members are very happy to answer these calls, apparently, or as we are seeing with the reports that are emerging. And, and, you know, on the other hand, you've got the people back home in Europe, the continent, which is suffering as a whole, especially the United Kingdom and France and elsewhere, where you're seeing strikes, mass strikes and uh, uh, protests in inflation rising, a cost of living crisis. And the, the, it's the people that are footing the bill. What's your thoughts on that? Well, I think there's a growing division among the, the political leadership across the West and the people. But again, uh, a lot of the people su su will support this because uh, our first instinct is we, we want to help Ukraine. We see you know, horrible things happening there to its people and we want to help. Uh, the, the problem, I think, is the media and the politicians. They've deceived people to a large extent what the helping Ukraine means because we have this narrative that Ukraine just always wanted to join NATO, be part of the West, and then Russia uh, just you know attacked un unprovoked. Uh, but again, since uh, you know since early 90s, even Bill Clinton argued in 94 that expanding NATO could redivide the continent. And if you redivide the continent, you're going to have competition over where the new dividing lines go, and that's what we've had. I mean, uh, so many American leaders have uh, have argued this, pol you know, politicians, CIA directors. So uh, recognizing this, that this was a problem. Also, it's worth noting that uh, Ukraine never really wanted to be a part of NATO. Even NATO released a report back in 2011 where they recognized that uh, they can hardly find polling which finds 20%. Uh, you know, most of them will be less than 20% who wanted to join NATO. So we've helped. So we had a Ukraine that wanted to get along with Russia, didn't want to join NATO. But after we helped toppling the government in 2014, uh, we essentially took Ukraine, didn't want to be a part of NATO, uh, put it in the firing line. Uh, and uh, arm, armed it. The British have obviously been sabotaging any peace agreements uh, under Boris Johnson, and well, they can continue to. And uh, you know, all these weapons we send, it has a purpose: is to avoid any negotiations. So, in my opinion, we we yeah we have led Ukraine to destruction, and now we see both NATO and Russia having destroyed this country, and it's it, it's horrific. Yeah. So I don't I don't think people realize that we haven't been helping Ukraine. We we have been destroying it in an effort to fight a proxy war with Russia. So it's, um, it's yeah, I, I agree with my colleague in Sweden. I think this, this was unnecessary. It was easy to prevent and it's led to a disaster, not just for the Ukrainians, but now uh, also for, for Europe as our economies are now collapsing. If not well, collapsing, the, weakening. Sorry. Weakening, yeah. The, uh, the weapons and the arms manufacturing companies are making a lot of profits. And the politicians, according to reports on both sides of the pond in the U.S. and the U.K., had made investments in those arms manufacturing companies. In any case, I'm afraid we have run out of time. Let me thank our guests for their contribution. Jan Oberg is the founder of Transnational.life, joining us from Lund, Sweden. And Glenn Diesen is a professor of political science at the University of Southeastern Norway from Oslo, Norway. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. And that brings an end to another edition of the News Review.